It's July 14th, 1946, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Aria, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. This is the day that Dr. Benjamin Spock's Common Sense Book of Baby and Child Care was published in the US, creating the so-called Spock Generation. Dr. Spock was a practicing paediatrician who had started to question some of the then contemporary advice around parenting. So over a long period of time, he had developed his own ideas and written his own book for parents. And it was absolutely massive. It's worth noting that uh, it sold more than 50 million copies, was second only in the US to the Bible, and was translated into more than 40 languages, and really did usher in this total shift in how people thought about parenting. 50 million copies I find hard to get my head around, because that's like the population of the UK, isn't it, more or less, the adult population right. of the UK. Yeah. And yet, I have never seen one in a charity shop. So what's that? Did everyone just keep <laughs> hold of their Dr. Spock book? Because it's always Adrian Mole and the Da Vinci Code. I've never seen this book. But, you know, weirdly, it, that wouldn't surprise me because actually it is a tome that it sat on my parents' shelves. And I know that they wouldn't give it up at first because it was filled with advice that they wanted to follow, but probably after that because it was it had a kind of sentimental place in the home and their hearts. So they, they wouldn't have given it to a charity shop. And you'd pass it down, I guess, to generations, wouldn't you? And say, look, right. this, is what, this is the book we used when we brought you up, son. Yeah. Except that some of the advice in it has now been discredited, correct? Yes. Well, there, it's now in its, I think there's been 10 editions. So it is actually still going. Spock actually died in the 90s, but there have been three more editions since his death. That was clever of him. <laughs> well <done>. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even write a book and I'm alive. <laughs> How did you do the audiobook? <laughs> Uh, and in the latest editions, you'll find advice about things like, you know, uh, gay parenting, etc., which mm. obviously was Probably not, not top of the mind radar. In 1946, yeah, yeah mm. exactly. And some of the early editions were very, you know, at the time, there was no such thing really as parenting advice. It was basically mothering advice. The idea that mm. the fathers should be doing this, that or the other wasn't really considered. So some of the early editions were very, you know, it refers to the parent as she or her and the baby is always referred to as he, which he then corrected in later editions to make it a bit more gender neutral and Spock did say in later life that his great although he was pleased with the success his fear was always that his advice might inadvertently lead to you know the death or harm to a child and he did actually in his first edition advise putting babies on their stomachs to sleep which mm. has now been discredited as that can be linked to sudden infant death syndrome so obviously now modern editions will tell you that the the current advice is to put babies on their backs to sleep. But the basic thesis of the book, which is what was different, well, it's summed up in the first sentence, isn't it? The first sentence of the book is, trust yourself, you know more than you think you do. Mm -hmm. It's kind of just saying to parents, look, there's, I mean, it's called The Common Sense Book of Baby and Child Care, and it is about kind of telling you as a parent that you have it in yourself to know what to do, and don't worry, it's fine to be feeling out of your depth and to be sleep-deprived, and it's fine if your child screams all night, even if you followed the prescribed schedules and routines, because that's part of parenthood. And no one had ever said that in print before. No doctor had ever reassuringly said that. Yeah, and when you look back to previous child-rearing experts in the 1900s, they really were talking about conformity and detachment. Those were kind of the two key guiding principles with uh, bringing up kids. And in 1928, uh, a chap called John B. Watson, who's one of the founders of behaviorist psychology, argued that children should be treated as adults. And this was kind of underpinning so much about how people came at child-rearing at the time. So, he was saying mothers should have strict schedules for their children, they should let them cry themselves to sleep, they should avoid too much love and attention, and he even advocated never hugging or kissing your kid. Yeah, this was a very common theme. There was a, a book published in 1916 called The Mother and Her Baby, once again, very mother-centric. <laughs> and it had it advised... Now, this is treating the baby as though the baby is some kind of, like, hot plate. It says, <laughs> handle the baby as little as possible. Turn it occasionally from side to side. Feed it, change it, keep it warm and let it alone. <laughs> and when it's done, poke it with a fork and <laughs> take it out of the oven and consume it. <laughs> this, this, this is from the same manual. Now I picture this, you're a mother confronted with a baby that will not stop crying. You open mm. your copy of the mother and her baby and you get the advice that you should speak to him firmly. Give him to understand <laughs> that he must stop crying. And if he does not, turn him over and administer a good spanking. Wow, that's wow. the advice. 
Crikey. Yeah, and it was it, the, the kind of the theme running through it is basically this puritanical idea of original sin, you know, that children are inherently evil and selfish. And if you don't <laughs> correct them, they will grow up to be spoiled, entitled brats. And basically mm. everything that is pushing you in one direction, your nurturing instinct, parental love, those are sentimental hogwash and you must eliminate them and stick to the routines that we have laid out. Mm. But I think it takes something for like an analytical scientific person to really push a thesis of trust yourself. Mm. Because in a way, it takes some of the academic analysis out of the situation, doesn't it? Like, and it turns out that he was, Dr. Spock, quite a intrinsically trusting man. There, I, I read this account from his biographer who said how she went into his office with no proven track record of ever having written a biography before and pitched herself as, I mean, she had a PhD, but she wasn't an author, pitched herself as the person who should write his biography. And she walked away from that first meeting with all of his notes and, you know, a whole load of inside in, information about how he'd written this massively best selling book. And she said, you know, that was his management style. Basically, he mm. trusted people. And I don't know, it's quite nice, isn't it, to collaborate with people in work generally, never mind bringing up a child. In any mm. task, it's quite nice to collaborate with people when they trust you and you trust them. And it's something that is often just lacking, I think, from all kinds of management styles, including parenting, which is just like, trust that you do have some instinct here. You don't have to learn everything from a book. Yeah, and crucially, he actually worked with mothers and babies for years when he was writing the book, which was something that hadn't really been done before. The idea that mothers might actually have something useful to say about yeah. parenting techniques was not really yeah. considered. And it reminded me, actually, of, you know, in the past, midwives for centuries were at births and basically did everything. And then it was all taken over by doctors and midwives were seen as, you know, something ignorant and unscientific and something consigned to the past. And then in the last hundred years or so, midwives have sort of been reintroduced because we recognise that actually that does serve a really useful function. Rebecca, I meant to interrogate you about your interesting passion for parenting podcasts and why exactly you love them so much <laughs> when you don't actually have kids. You know. Do you know what? I really do. There's a one I listen to called Mom and Dad are Fighting where people write in. It's a Slate podcast and people write in with their parenting dilemmas. I think it's just... It's one of those ones where you, when you don't have kids, I don't have any kids, so I love to just be like, this is what I would do. And this <laughs> is definitely right. And I will not have to prove it because I don't oh have any gosh. children to demonstrate it on, but it would definitely ah, work. It's so true. Before having kids of my own, it was so pleasing to be able to walk around looking at friends and family and go, oh, no, 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 can't, that can't possibly be the right thing to do without having to actually do anything myself. This has all been very interesting. But Rebecca, be honest, when you heard that we were going to be talking about Dr. Spock, because this was Arian's suggestion, when you heard that, did you picture Leonard Nimoy? Because I <laughs> no, but you know what's weird is that apparently the people who made Star Trek said that they did not name him after Doctor yeah. Spock. But, I f but no. that's not true, is it? That can't possibly be true it because it was probable. the 1960s. He was a gigantic household name. Yeah. So you, why would you do it unless it was a reference to Doctor Spock? So Gene Roddenberry claims that he likes strong-sounding names with K's in them. So that's how you get Captain Kirk and Picard as well. And Spock mm. was just one of those. It didn't mean anything. Um, and in fact, Spock is actually... In fact, <laughs> in this ridiculous fiction that people care about, <laughs> Spock is actually his first name. It's not his last name. Oh. But uh, he's Dr. Spock Benjamin. It's a completely different character. <laughs> Spock, comma, Benjamin. Um, <laughs> Um, no, his his surname is said to be unpronounceable because it's in whatever language of you know his his people come from. Um, but this is going to blow your mind. He's not called Doctor Spock in Star what? Trek at all. Wait, 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 yeah. wait, wait! I'm reassessing so, everything I knew. Right. So I hear the it's word Doctor Spock. Guy. I picture Leonard Nimoy, but in fact, in Star Trek, again, in fact, he is called <laughs> Mister Spock. He's not referred to as Doctor Spock ever, apart from once when someone's using it ironically to say, "So, Doctor Spock, what would you recommend?" But otherwise, he's referred to as Mister Spock, and it's the conflation in the public imagination between Doctor Spock's baby book uh, and yeah. Mister Spock from Star Trek that has created huh. the thing where we all think he's called Doctor Spock and he isn't. It isn't that he got a nonsense degree from Trump University. <laughs> <laughs> Tomorrow. He said paintings are like a beer, only beer tastes good and it's hard to stop drinking beer. <laughs> <laughs> Love the show? Support the show. Patreon.com slash Retrospectors. Part of the ACAST Creator Network.